Well, hello everyone and welcome to today's um, webinar brought to you by, by Lux Review. And uh, today we are going to be talking about power over Ethernet. One of those new things that we hear an awful lot about, but all suspect that we don't actually know an awful lot about. Uh, it's one of those things that has come with the electronic revolution. Uh, it's coming fast on the heels of, of LEDs, and it's almost if every time we wake up in the morning, something else has changed. Uh, for someone of, of my kind of age, uh, who grew up with people like Isaac, Isaac Asimov, this is the future writ large. So this is going to be a very, very interesting one for me today, and I hope for everyone listening. Um, we have Dwight Stewart with us. Dwight is the founder and the uh, CTO of Igor. Uh, Igor is a company um, that is producing a, a platform for uh, power over Ethernet uh, opportunities, and he'll be explaining to us what it, that means. And we also have uh, John Barkermans with us, uh, Chief Technical Officer of Cisco's Internet of Things Solutions Group. So there we are. We've managed to get the Internet of Things into this discussion before the discussion has even started. Um, what I would like to do for, for those of you who are possibly new to the webinar and new to this platform is just to tell you a little bit about the landscape of what you've got on your screen. It's all uh, pretty obvious. Right in the middle there, you've got the slides. And that's where the, the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation will appear. Uh, let me say now, before, before I forget, that um, the presentation will be available. Um, it becomes available tomorrow because the whole of the next hour is recorded and will be available as an archive recording for the next 12 months. And as part of that package, you can download the PowerPoint presentation, which makes that so much more fun. Bottom left-hand corner of your screen, probably, you can see a little Q&A box. And if you can't see the box, there's that purpley colored uh, button at the bottom of the screen, which can bring it up for you. If you've got a question, Ask a question any time you like uh, during the course of the presentation. It doesn't go to uh, the presenter. It will come to me, and I will be, be moderating those questions. And what we do is that we let our, present, uh, our presenters get on with it so they can give us their story, and we can, uh, and we can all listen to the, to, 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 to the whole thing without interruption. Then when we get to the end, we'll have a Q&A, and I'll be looking at all the questions that are coming in, and we'll be asking questions um, to, to our presenters on the basis of the questions that you ask, uh, so that you will get your questions uh, uh, asked, answered in due course. Um, if you are asking questions that might be a little bit more sensitive or might be a little bit more personal to you, don't expect me to answer, don't expect me to, to actually ask them that question because the, the, those e, those questions will be available on, on an email and you'll probably get um, a direct response from one of our presenters. Um, so there we are. I think that's everything that I need to say for the time being. I just want to sit, settle back and listen and see what's going to happen. Um, we're opening up with John Barkermans, who's going to explain to us the. Um, the landscape that we see ourselves in, in in respect of the Internet of Things and how that then fits into power over Ethernet, and then we'll be handing over to Dwight. So, gentlemen, um, welcome to Lux Review webinar, and uh, John, away you go. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate your introduction here, and um, yeah, let me take it. Let me take it uh, from here. And as you can see in the first slide, what, what I try to do is, is make sure that people understand a little bit the landscape, the global, the, the, the global landscape, because that's how we look at it from a Cisco perspective. And of course, a lot of it is driven, especially, I think, um, when you understand a little bit more about smart cities and about technologies in smart cities, there's a lot of talk about the Internet of Things. And of course, not just in smart cities or in businesses, but also in your personal life. So the Internet of Things or connecting the unconnected, connecting everything you see around you is very much driving a lot of this, what we call perfect storm. Now, the perfect storm is happening in a number of areas. One, there is, um, there is the need to make buildings even more smarter or intelligent as they are today. And, and you will hear a little bit more from Dwight and myself how we see that happening and how we feel that that more intelligent building can really help to create 
a new workforce experience because that's really the driver. The driver is not the technology itself. The driver is what you can do with it and how it can change the way people are going to experience things like work. And we believe that it will first happen in the commercial enterprise, but then, of course, it will also happen much more, let me call it streamlined, in your personal life. And we know that there is a lot of things happening in your personal life, but it's not always very well connected to each other. It's not standards-based, and I think we can improve on that a lot more. Now, the real driver for a lot of this is actually lighting, and lighting has been around for a while, but um, lighting hasn't changed very much since, I would say, uh, 100 years or so, and the real driver for, for the lighting disruption is LED. LED lighting has now become almost like, like a de facto standard, uh, especially in the enterprise world. And the LED lighting has a number of opportunities uh, where we can latch upon and where we can build almost like a platform upon to, to create a number of these workforce experience solutions I just talked about. Now, but of course, the real driver for all of this uh, we believe is convergence. And convergence, you must have heard about. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see typically how today's um, buildings, commercial buildings, are typically being built. You have separate kind of siloed networks sitting nicely next to each other and not really talking to each other. Some of them might have a building management system where some of these capabilities come together and where a building automation can speak uh, or can understand uh, the fire system or can understand the state of the lighting system. But that seems to be only in about 10% of, uh, of the global buildings. Where we want to go and where we think this will go is that all of these separate siloed systems will start to understand each other's status, can start to talk to each other, and because they can start to talk to each other and they can stand, they can understand each other's status, you can create a number of solutions or, or experiences you were not able to create before. And we believe that the trigger of a lot of this is in lighting, because lighting is everywhere in your building. And lighting has become actually one of these uh, one of these um, disrupting technologies, as we call them, um, actually leading a lot of this evolution moving forward. And the reason is very simple. Lights have become LED lights, and these LED lights have become so efficient that you can not only power them now from the network, but they also become connected directly to the network. So. What we are seeing and what we are doing today, and, and we are helping the industry with that, is that light fixtures are fully network connected. Every light in your building becomes IP addressable. And we give them that, uh, we, get, we give through that connectivity, we also give them power. Dwight will talk a little bit more about that. But because of that connectivity, because every light is not just a light anymore. It also becomes a sensing point for a number of, of things like temperature, like um, presence. Um, it becomes a very important part of that connected environment inside of your building. So it will be, it will be driven, we believe, in the next couple of years by the adoption of LED lighting. LED lighting becomes fully connected. And we believe that there is more than just lighting which will share um, this, this evolution of even smarter buildings than where we are today. And that's what we have come up with. We had to give it as a name because we wanted to make sure that, that, that people understood that um, beyond lighting, we also see building automation components um, actually becoming natively IP connected. And we believe that once you have lights, once you have, for example, actuators or valuable air valve controllers uh, inside of a building, once you get them to talk to each other in a much more open standards-based uh, environment, and today, as some of you might know, I've seen the list of, uh, of attendees. Most of you come from, from a lighting space or a building automation space. Um, 
it's typically still a very proprietary world. It's typically a world where if you want to have lights and building components talk to each other, you need to go through gateways, you need to go through a building automation system, and that's not always as efficient as it should be. What we're trying to achieve is make all of these components talk to each other in the same language, using the same protocol, using the same information model, so that you can create new applications on top of these, um, let me call it infrastructure capabilities, the way you see today uh, an iPhone or, or a, a, an Android phone has a number of sensors, and people were able to, just on top of those phone platforms, were able to create a lot of new applications. We see the digital ceiling, as we call it, another platform to create much more applications onto than what you can do today. And we believe that that platform should be in the hands of much more people than just the, the specialized companies who do it today. And we believe, believe that it's also an opportunity for those companies to enhance their capabilities to create new experiences out there. And I'll give you an example of that in a second on how we in Cisco and on how we, uh, with, for example, together with Igor, we go jointly to customers. So Cisco has created this thing called Digital Ceiling. We are leading that into the industry. Uh, I'll show you in a second uh, that we have an ecosystem of partners today. Of course, Igor is one of those partners. But what we really want to create is smart, secure, and seamlessly connected buildings. And that smart is one thing, but most importantly, security is another thing. Because, of course, once you connect a lot more than what is connected today, you need to make that secure. And that's also the biggest threat of the Internet of Things. I get that question every single time from any customer I meet with. How can I make this secure? How can you ensure that people cannot hack my building through my, through my ceiling, through my lighting network, for example? So we, we, we will put a lot of emphasis on making it all end-to-end -end secure. So what do we mean and, and how do we basically address this now? So we created a number of building blocks we believe are important to actually go and create these digital ceilings or digital buildings over time. First and foremost, we believe that no company can do this alone. It is always an ecosystem approach, whether you are in lighting, whether you are in building automation, whether you are a network company like us, you always need to partner. Partnering is key. And the way you partner, of course, what you do is you try to establish open ways for people to communicate with each other because that makes um, lights from company X work together with control capabilities from company Y. And that only helps the adoption of both companies' technologies. That's what we've done at Cisco for the last 30 years in the IT industry. And we believe that open standards-based approach is actually also the way to go in the Internet of Things, uh, especially in smart buildings. Of course, you don't want to put anything out, where, uh, anything out there which is not tested. So that's why we create validated designs. We jointly put our technology together with our partners in a lab. We test it out. We try to hack it and all those kind of things. And then we define the best way you as a customer can actually roll this out in your environment. So those validated designs, that testing is critical and crucial. Of course, you uh, here as, as a company where we are trying to connect all of these things together, we also need to create specialized capabilities so that we actually understand the particular application. And if the application is lighting, we will make sure that if you connect a light through CAT5 or CAT6 now to the network, that the network knows, hey, there is a light connected and it asks to be, um, you know, it asks to get 27 watts of power and it asks to be secure, we will do all of that natively directly as part of the network. Uh, so we will really recognize what is connected. Uh, we will not just treat it as a standard, generic uh, kind of endpoint which needs a little bit of power and which needs an IP connection. No, we really make sure that we know what is connected. And last but not least, openness means that people can communicate over a common protocol and over a common language so that we optimize the way these different kind of elements, lights, uh, building automation components, can talk to each other and people actually can actually create new applications on top of that. 
and applications that are plenty. And this, this is just a list of a number of use cases. If you think about lighting as such, these are a number of use cases you can think of uh, which actually are uh, possible and, and, and you can see that there are, I put them in, in like columns or buckets and if you want to focus on energy savings, there you go. You have a number of, of applications or use cases you could focus on, uh, but typically it's not just one column and one particular row you focus on. You focus on a number of things altogether because the cool thing about LED lights, for example, is now you can color tune these lights. It means that you can have very white light, yellowish light, according to almost like the way the sun is coming up in the morning, uh, it goes to, uh, to a high in, in, in the sky, the sun is then very, very white and it goes back to yellowish. They call that circadian rhythm. So now you can even play with that circadian rhythm uh, inside of your offices and actually, by the way, it helps people to focus more uh, in the afternoon. It helps people to be more productive actually in the offices and that has been proven many, many times. And then, of course, you have the, Im the immense amount of data you will, you will have available because all of these luminaires, all of these lights from the different partners will have sensors. And that sensing data is now amazing amount of data to optimize the way you run your business, to optimize the way you give people in an office a particular experience um, which you could never do before. So sensing integrated into lighting is really a very important use case and will drive a number of things moving forward. And again, there uh, Dwight will, will talk and touch about uh, on that uh, a little bit later. So now just let, give me, let me give you a, a, an example of, of what we do uh, in Cisco where we see a lot of customers approaching us to do the same thing. So in, in a typical enterprise, I'm sure you remember that people have fixed desks fixed offices, fixed cubicles, um, well, that is going away. I'm sure you know that or, or I'm sure you know somebody whose fixed desk is going away and now you have to take a desk uh, or a workspace, whatever is available into your building. Of course, that is done to, to save uh, on, on workspace because workspace is very costly in a lot of areas uh, in the world. So if you can optimize the amount of workspaces, uh, then you can save not just on rent, but also on energy uh, and everybody wins. Of course, for those people who still come to the office, you want to give them the best possible experience they have, even the better one versus what they had before when they had this fixed desk. Because what you want to do is you want to give them the best experience for the type of task they're actually doing today. And we see that a lot of companies are failing there. If you have this fixed workspace, that fixed workspace is not optimized for a video call. It's not optimized for collaboration. It's not optimized to be a little bit uh, quiet and focused. You can't do that. So typically what you then have to do as a person is move around uh, to different areas of your, of your workspace and perhaps you don't have enough quiet rooms. What if you could select the particular workspace you need, the time you need it, and that workspace is optimized for what you actually require to be done at that point in time? That's what we're doing at Cisco. At Cisco, there's no, almost no more fixed workspaces. So what's happening is you come into a building. You come into the ground floor and you basically select, um, let me call it a big iPad or a big kiosk, the type of workspace you need for the next couple of hours. Could be an office, could be an open workspace, could be a quiet room. Uh, it doesn't really matter. What, is, what matters though is when you select that workspace, and when you come into that workspace, that workspace is now optimized for you. Because first, we know who you are. We know your profile. We know you like, like in this case on the slide, it's a little bit of yellowish light. We know you like yellowish type of light. Um, and we know that, you know, you, we know that in that, in that particular regard, um, when you enter that office, that office now is optimized for you and has your profile uh, being active. But of course, when you get into that office, uh, you might want to change that. You might want to change that. Uh, you typically don't do that anymore via light switches. You use an app for that because the app 
uh, is actually connected to everything inside of the building, to the lights, to the heating, to the cooling. And you use the, you use the app to, for example, change the color from yellowish to more bluish or white light, and you can do that with one touch of a button. And because that, you're going to do a video call in that office, now your light is optimized for a video call, for a, for a, for a video call um, for the next couple of minutes. Or you want to change temperatures. Again, comfort levels of that particular room you can change with one push of a button. Things like thermostats, things like um, you know all these switches and all that stuff, we believe uh, might still might still be there in the next couple of years, but I think will over time go away. Because whether you are local or whether you are remote, you can control everything uh, because everything is connected over time. And of course, when you have um, video or collaboration capabilities in that room, you want to you wanna have them optimized for you. They will automatically be logged in with your profile. So when you come into that room, it's as if that room is your office, but it's not. It will be shared with somebody else. And the moment you leave that office, you, you, you liberate it again and you basically go and uh, work, for example, with a couple of colleagues in an open space. And that's what we mean with you should be able to optimize the experience from the room uh, wherever you are. What I always say is you, don't, you shouldn't have to adapt the room to you. The room should adapt to you because it knows you are in that room. So instead of coming into every room and turning on the lights, turning down the thermostat, opening the blinds, that should all happen automatically now because the room knows you are in the room and that's how this system works. And this, just another example, right? How many times do you have, uh, you know, the, 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 the fact that either you're alone in a meeting room or you are with, in this case, five other people. What is different from two, the, the two scenarios is you only typically have one thermostat and you only have so much, let me call it air, pumped into that room. Guess when you need more air is when there are more people. How can the room know that there is six people in the room versus one person in the room, and how could the room automatically adjust the amount of air being pumped in the room um, when there is six people versus one? And that's exactly what digital ceiling is all about, because when a sensor can see that there are six people in the room, and can, when the sensor can talk directly to the cooling and say, hey, give us some more air because there's now six people in the room, that's exactly what we mean with creating new applications, and that's exactly what a digital ceiling is really all about. That's why we created this ecosystem of, of partners and where the technologies they typically are the experts in are able to talk a lot more easily to all the other technologies within the room, and we're starting in the ceiling. Now, as I said, you can't do this alone, so we created um, an ecosystem, and we're still adding more partners to the party. Um, and of course, Igor, in this case, uh, who, um, who are hosting this, uh, this webinar, is part of this. They've been part of this uh, from the start. And um, yeah, we, we are doing joint projects where they take their expertise, where we take our networking expertise, and we do joint go-to-market with them um, as, as uh, two joint uh, go-to-market partners. So no slide set from Cisco would be complete without some form of architecture. This is a very high-level architecture, I know. Uh, and what it says is very simple. On the bottom, you have the ceiling. In the ceiling, you have typically now the luminaires. The luminaires are, are network connected. On one side, they have the lights. On the other side, they have the sensors. Of course, they're all interconnected together. They get their power uh, from a network switch. That switch sits either in the ceiling or in a closet. You have both of those uh, architectures fully supported. But at the same time, that switch will also talk to um, possibly cameras in your building, access points, heating and cooling equipment. And over time, you see a lot more functions actually natively talking IP and natively talking the same language. And the whole reason is, of course, to um, optimize the way applications whether they are local, running in the, um, in the building, or whether they are running on the cloud, you want to have those applications being able to access those resources or get data from those resources in an optimized, secure way. That is the key. Security is key. And security, of course, is not just security 
um, in the cloud or in the connectivity is end-to-end. -end. It starts with, um, you know, uh, authentication mechanisms from the luminaires. It starts with key management. Uh, it's, of course, part of the, uh, the IoT gateways or routers or switches, whatever you call it in your language, uh, have a lot of security. Uh, when they connect now to the cloud or to applications hosted in the cloud, you need all of that security as well. So <laughs> we have a lot of security being part of this. You can't just do this without security. Security is front and center when you talk about the Internet of Things. Last but not least, uh, we are very proud that even after only launching this in February of this year um, at one of the Cisco Live events, we actually won from Realcom, which we believe is like a, a, very, uh, a very renowned uh, kind of organization. We won the Best Technology Innovation Award for Cisco Digital Feeling. And of course, I don't attribute it to Cisco. I attribute it to all our partners and to our joint uh, you know, uh, areas of focus where we really want to change this uh, digital ceiling focus into a, into a more open and standard-based way to actually go and connect smarter buildings. That's what I have to say. So let me now turn it over to Dwight. Dwight will turn it uh, more into the focus area from Igor, and then uh, I'll talk back to you guys um, at the Q&A. Thank you, John. That was a fantastic overview. Uh, I'm going to dive into some more specifics related to lighting and uh, kind of the how and why. So kind of uh, to talk a little bit about this, uh, I'm going to talk about how, what attracted us to power over Ethernet lighting. What is it? How is it done? What, uh, why do it? And my common misconceptions and key considerations. So kind of just to talk a little bit about my history and, and why I see this as really uh, a disruptive and timely uh, endeavor. I started a company uh, about uh, 15 years ago that over the course of six years grew to 40 employees, linked it up with multiple uh, building control systems, integrated to about 30 different protocols, and leveraged that data collection for energy and other types of resources that building consume, and brought that up to the cloud. And many different companies were then building applications on top of that data. So it's similar to some of the opportunities that exist with this. However, if you look at the way building automation systems are today, they're typically uh, HVAC centered, so heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and they're also more monolithic. Uh, the protocols that they use, uh, really what our business uh, opportunity was there was uh, to open up a very closed, proprietary, uh, difficult to integrate systems into something that unified a variety of protocols, uh, and that is a big issue. We would spend at that company a year sometimes waiting for the integrations to be available and uh, doing a lot of coordination with the different parties to make that happen. Uh, so that really creates this opportunity uh, to create an intelligent building network that connects products with services using an open and intuitive platform and then uh, moving from more of a uh, siloed approach to a value add model. So, based on that previous experience, uh, had a lot of different uh, investors that were interested in the business. Uh, one party uh, that showed interest was Cisco Systems, maintained a very strong relationship with them. And about three years ago, they approached me about this uh, concept of using power over Ethernet for lighting. So, if we look at specifically this opportunity with, within lighting, uh, we can see that today, lighting has a, a number of different uh, friction points and barriers to entry uh, and uh, places where there can be a great deal of optimization. So expense right now, the labor uh, where it has to be uh, expensive labor classes that are very specific to high electrical uh, code, uh, the materials associated with that also are expensive. Uh, and then the commissioning process, it's not very simple. Uh, it, it's usually very hands-on. There's lots of different cabling and, and standards that you have to be very well aware of. And then the operations, uh, inevitably, as you create complex systems, things fail. So uh, to be able to adapt and, and identify and troubleshoot quickly, it's 
so that you can really focus on the interesting things you want to do with your investment versus just maintaining a system. If you look at the energy consumption itself, it's the largest consumer of, of uh, energy within a building or electricity. It goes to lighting. So to minimize that impact, it's a great payback opportunity to sell the system into a building, and then once, it in, once it's in, you can leverage it for all these other features that John was just talking about. And typical systems are very limited in their functionality. It's typically on-off and, and some dimming control. Uh, and control systems, if they are in place, run parallel and integrate with AC systems. So you have both of these topologies sitting next to each other. And by unifying them, it, it eliminates, once again, those, all these types of cabling, uh, and it, it becomes uh, something that is much more easy to maintain. And at the end of the day, you're left with basically a crude form of illumination and, and not much else. So what we saw is this opportunity with Power Over Ethernet. And Power Over Ethernet, um, really, to break it down and, and talk about things technically, it provides 60 watts worth of power per port. And so you have a, a Power Over Ethernet switch, which we provided by Cisco. And then using standard, which is a standard Power Over Ethernet, a system that is IEEE standard, then using standard Ethernet cable, you're able to both power and data uh, communicate with those devices. So once you enable a device such as lights or sensors with power over Ethernet, then it just becomes a plug and play solution. It's not only is that nice for installation, but also, and we'll talk more about this later, it becomes portable, which is key when you think about how data, and the system is very data-centric, how data can play a role into better understanding either automatically or providing reports, and then allow for things to change with you over time. So as John was talking about how these workspaces aren't fixed so much anymore, or you, you want to, moving into this world of agile and being able to adapt spaces to building needs as they change, we want to be able to use that data for retail, for instance, where they might see how uh, a space is, could be configured differently to test out new theories as to how it may drive additional revenue or savings for them. And to move those lights around while they change the aisle layouts and things, that provides a, a very unique opportunity to quickly and inexpensively iterate. Uh, you can deploy any sensor anytime, anywhere, by, sense, by simply just connecting up to a nearby light. And lights are everywhere. So what better place to leverage than the lighting infrastructure? And then it's a software-defined network that allows you to adapt, as I described earlier, and the cloud analytics also play a role there. Uh, it automatically commissions as you install, so the data, by being um, also by not being an AC solution, and typically in that case everything would come on at once, you can be plugging things in as you go and bring this, uh, the system online one at a time and really identify what it is that you're working with at that moment as you install it and quickly uh, commission as you install. It's also uh, an open system to accelerate that innovation and integration, moving more to a value-add type product. So specifically, how does this happen? So the first step is enabling devices with Power Over Ethernet. And the nice thing about this process is that there's already power supplies in a fixture, for instance. So you remove that cost, and then you would include the Power Over Ethernet node. And by doing that, now you've added a tremendous number of capabilities, obviously, for data, but, uh, but it's a very simple process. And so now it's receiving power and data con connectivity so that it's basically performing as a normal light, except it's just plugging into the network using Power Over Ethernet. Also, since it uses a trickle charge, Power Over Ethernet uh, it is when you plug something in, or when nothing's plugged in, I should say, then it just has a trickle charge, enough to just um, less than what you'd really get zapped by if you put your uh, tongue on a battery. And then once that's plugged in, it powers the microprocessor on the node just enough for it to talk and communicate back to the switch and request higher power levels. So it's a very safe architecture as well. And then you configure the node using software to be appropriate for how you're, you've installed it. If we look at the key components, then as those nodes are then attached to the network, and, and 
as we can see, to uh, a switch, and you'd have uh, certain switches that would be designated for certain locations and uh, also having certain switches with UPSs and things for power backups. But then you have that site automation software that discovers all these devices and automates that missioning and automation as well as data collection and then bringing that up to the cloud analytics so that you can provide optimizations and also transparency, once again, into all these little nuances that are always the gotchas. And so by having all this data and parsing that data and providing actionable data, uh, actual information that will identify and alert you if there's problems and then allow you to drill down to find out exactly what that problem is, that's very key to be able to act and act um, efficiently so that you spend your time wisely. We look at the, the node itself and, and kind of that architecture, what the feature set is there. Nodes can be very versatile or they can be very limited. Uh, and they both have their place. So if you have a more versatile node, you're going to have something that is a little bit more costly, but then you can have things that are very specific and it's going to be more cost optimized. So each has its place. Uh, you can have nodes that are daisy chained, so they share a common home run back to a power brief that switch, which saves you on, on that kind of capital expense as well. Uh, but in effect, you really need to have a solution that provides for facilitating a, a wide range of lights and off the shelf sensors and wall switches. One of the other things Cisco talks frequently about is IT uh, emerging with OT. And there's this collision happening in all these worlds, all these industries, where IT is playing a role now. And that OT, or operational technology, are the, the, the established products that have been proven. So, you know, it's domains where sensors, for instance, there's companies that really understand sensors. There's lights that, uh, lighting companies that have been doing optics for decades. And so leveraging that wisdom and that domain knowledge with companies that understand IT and the value and, and how to apply analytics and automation is absolutely key for success. And we believe that uh, because of this, this new, you know, so many new types of um, expertise needing to be played here, uh, so just to uh, reiterate what John said, it's about that value add. It's about that ecosystem. Uh, no one person can be, no one company can be an expert at everything. If we look at the data analytics, then once again, it's that opportunity for tier two support to be uh, more effective than a lot of tier one supports could be on site. Moving to a, a process that can uh, reduce cost and, and facilitate an efficient operation as much as possible. Uh, you know, data driven applications and automations are a huge opportunity with this. Uh, collecting data and being able to do support is the first step in, in a very long roadmap of opportunities. Uh, if we look directly, look at uh, an example of Tesla, for instance. Each Tesla drives maybe 10 to 20,000 miles a year, but they collect all this data from each mile that it drives, enormous amounts of data, and they collect a billion miles worth of data per year because of that whole aggregate of all those cars. The opportunity there is that they are able to mine that data and actually create algorithms to create the autopilot program that they have in place. Autopilot wouldn't even be possible if it weren't for the fact that they had that data to mine, not only to create the algorithms, but then to test against, to verify that those algorithms do indeed uh, you know, produce a result that's acceptable and wouldn't you know, create crashes, for instance. So it uh, becomes a very valuable uh, opportunity. So now let's talk about some of the benefits uh, beyond what we've already mentioned before. Uh, one is a global standard of compatibility. So if we look, uh, you know, I've been to a, a conference where one of the first things I received was a universal adapter because there were a lot of people from across the world. And you, there's all kinds of different plugs, voltages for outlets across the world. And, you know, there's, quite frankly, the, uh, the power quality can be a big issue as well. We'll get into that in just a second. But this is a standard. The 
power over Ethernet and Ethernet cabling in general, that RJ45 jack, it's a standard across the entire planet. So it makes it very easy for, to, for companies to scale across boundaries and borders uh, into other opportunities geographically. Uh, substantial cost savings. If we look at this is using the same strategies that is already proven within the controls industry, such as daylighting and motion sensing and things, but then being able to have it data-driven provides that hands-off, easy-to-configure autopilot uh, that uh, really opens up a number of opportunities. And if we look at network reliability, the Cisco switches, for instance, have a mean time between failures that are measured in decades versus typical drivers today for AC to DC within lights. Uh, you might have anywhere from a five to ten year uh, uh, warranty. So it, it's a, a very significant, um, you know, very high quality product that you could leverage across a number of different devices. So you're aggregating that investment instead of a bunch of cheap things. It becomes a, a more, uh, you know, high quality consolidated investment. And then you can also do UPS backups so that you can uh, have an option against uh, brownouts and things. And then it's not wireless, which for people who want to be ultra secure or, you know, in a day and age where you do have uh, issues with hacking and things, uh, sniffing traffic or disrupting traffic with using scramblers and things can be an issue for wire wireless uh, devices. It's um, also easy to deploy. So once again, it's a portable solution. Data analytics and apps can help drive insight into wanting to move things around, and then uh, that portability becomes very important as you want to change your space to meet your new needs. It's solid state, so it's susceptible to brownouts. Uh, uh, well, so solid state LEDs are susceptible to brownouts and to over voltage, so uh, this really helps provide a power conditioning system using power over Ethernet switches that is very effective. And lastly, uh, improved safety. It is a class two device, so it allows for a, a more wide range of uh, people to participate in installing or relocating lights as, your, uh, as you desire. And once again, to be able to deploy sensors very quickly, if you had an app that you wanted to buy a year from now, after you've done your install, it's very simple to just add sensors because you have this infrastructure, so it becomes the last mile that you deploy uh, the devices. If we look at the uh, some individual applications, we have a number of themes that, that you can play on, but uh, safety, security, health, and green are all, are all part of that. And John talked about a number of those uh, that uh, but I'll just pick out one here. So a bank, for instance, for security, seeing activity in off hours because of the motion sensors, now that data can come back. It can alert someone to do something. It could disable the wall switches so that the lights have to stay on for the cameras and, and people can be monitored and, and uh, people can do something about it. So then if we look at just the growth opportunity, it's massive. Uh, the benefits and simplicity and cost are really driving the growth. If you look at advanced controls, only it's only something like 4% of the buildings out there even have advanced controls, and it's just large projects because the small and medium footprints can't uh, really benefit uh, because it is costly to both as a CapEx and an OpEx. But moving from an HVAC-centric to lighting-centric, moving from fluorescent to LED, the short, uh, short lifespan commodity business is moving to more of a long lifespan future-proof business. And so all these trends uh, are really uh, forcing people to maximize their investment for energy savings, operational savings, and others. And uh, so we see this IT-centric or data-centric approach really emerging because of that. And you think about why not just leverage existing IT best practices in that case? So network security, network configuration, network monitoring, and those things which are already in place with a, a system such as, you know, Cisco uh, or, you know, Ethernet-based solutions. If we look at the uh, – oh, this slide here. Um, if we look at just some misconceptions out there, I just want to address some of these. Uh, if the data network goes down, 
that could be an issue, so do your lights. Well, there's ways to configure the network so that doesn't happen. You can have some lights on some switches, and so in, in a room with four lights, you can have each light going to a different switch. You can have certain switches UPS packed up. So there's ways to configure things so that it's more robust. Uh, PUE is limited in its commercial application. High bay lights are a good example of that. They, they consume way too much in wattage to be powered, but they can still be controlled. We, uh, for Igor anyway, we have our node enabled with a relay control. So we could actually uh, turn on and off high bay lights so it could still be part of that uh, software-defined uh, system. Uh, data cables and connectors are not suited for carrying electrical power. That's already been done for voice over IP and other power over Ethernet. It's very well understood. Power over Ethernet network uh, lighting can be attacked. Well, that's a good reason to have a, a good network configuration. You can either get, uh, there's plenty of uh, network uh, installers that understand that domain, which is yet another benefit because it's uh, well understood, or the system can be kitted to be most appropriate. And then does it deliver an appropriate payback for, um, for only in new builds? Well, there's a longer payback in, in retrofits, but usually, you know, it's going to be a two to three year payback. And, but the real big opportunity is the fact that this infrastructure is in place and it's just that last mile that if you wanted to expand the system, it's tacking onto that last mile. So you have, you can leverage, um, installing multiple systems simultaneously, let's say uh, a power over Ethernet Wi-Fi system, then you're going to have wire poles for each of those, and you uh, will greatly reduce the individual cost of each. So lastly here, um, you know, the critical ask for PUE capabilities, uh, if you're looking at doing such a system, these are some good things to really focus on. The cap expense of you know, what it costs to do a typical system uh, is you want to find something that really produces that, uh, that ROI. Um, and then also it becomes the install and commissioning process that feeds into that where having something that is really automated and simple, you know, simplicity is uh, something that really shows well for how well an architecture was thought through and thinking about the user first. So creating something that's simple and intuitive, and then that future system expansion that really helps with your future CapEx press, uh, costs as well as operational expenses, and then your ongoing energy savings. Uh, but we want to find a full technology platform that can focus on those lights and sensors, enabling existing lights and sensors, and then allow you to bring uh, various apps and services to the market or to your customers. So I really appreciate uh, the time uh, that you've given us. Uh, John, you want to open up for Q&A? Uh, Dwight, uh, absolutely fantastic. And, and John, thank you very much for that, that introduction to the whole thing. Um, for an old-fashioned wireman like me, uh, this really is a whole new universe. Uh, and before we get into the, 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 the Q&A, um, I would just like to let everyone know that the next webinar that's going to happen in a couple of weeks' time, uh, we're actually going to be talking about a topic which, at, at first sight, you go, really? But it really locks into the kind of things that we've been talking about, because we're going to be talking about the automatic testing of emergency lighting. Um, as a guy once said to me when I complained about how much time we would spend talking about emergency lighting on a project, he just looked me in the eye and he said, people die in buildings like this. And it kind of shuts you up and uh, puts you into a different place. And one of the problems that, that huge buildings have with um, their emergency lighting is that there is never enough time or money um, to be able to do the proper testing. So if we can introduce systems that enable that kind of thing to be done more efficiently, then fewer people die in buildings like this. And I think that's a good thing. So that's on the 14th of September, uh, same time, 1 p.m., British summertime and looking forward to that. We've got Jeremy Turner from Fab Controls and Andy Davis, uh, Head of Business Development at Harvard Engineering, who will be talking about that. Now, over to the Q&A, because uh, while Dwight and John have been talking, uh, loads of questions have been coming in. I've decided, because we've, uh, you blimey, we're 10 to the hour, um, I'm not going to concentrate on 
the bits and bobs of how these things work. Um, so, so those of you who've been asking questions about does this widget fit into that, what's it? Um, I'm just going to let people sort that out on, on emails because I think there are bigger fish to fry uh, on this one. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the idea of, of a building has, uh, is, is a time thing. A building is a time capsule. You build it, you open the doors, and that building will then work for 25 years, 50 years, 100 years. But we've got a technology which is, uh, you guys are defining it as disruptive. And I'm just wondering whether the disruptive nature of this technology will become its own stumbling block in being able to establish things like power over Ethernet in a building which will have so much purpose over a lifetime. Any thoughts on that? Well, I'll... Uh, I I'll go ahead, Dwight. I'll, I'll fill in. Yeah, uh, you know, my thoughts are you're going to have stumbling blocks. Uh, you're going to have problems. These things always happen, right? So you want a solution that can grow with you and adapt and adjust as your needs, uh, as you encounter new needs uh, because uh, those things happen. Um, but if you build a solution that it, it provides you multiple outcomes and diversifies your opportunities, then you're going to be well positioned uh, for when those events do occur. Okay. And in terms of diversification, um, the, 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 we, we've kind of come into a world where, uh, you know, if, if you decide to wear the Apple badge, everything that you buy will will be from Apple. And if, like me, you go. Um, I'm perfectly happy to work with Microsoft and therefore everything I buy is from Microsoft. In terms of diversification, will, will we see multiple standards which one will not talk to the other one, do you think? If, if, if a building gets 10 years down the line and it, it's got an Igor um, uh, platform in there, that, that's a whole Igor environment, and then they build an extension to that, Will they be obliged, you think, to come back into Igor to say, we'll have your next generation of stuff? Or will we, will we see some kind of common platform where the marketplace will be much more multi-sourced? Yeah, let me give you my, my, <laughs> my spin on that, and I'm sure Dwight will want to will wanna compliment. Um, that's exactly what we want to open up. Um, I, I think it's time that... Um, uh, open and real standards based and not semi standards or, or or things people call standards but are really uh, having different implementations according to different vendors. Uh, we believe that it's time to open up. Um, and when you open it up and when you make it you know simple, right? Every PC or every laptop you connect into the network has to speak um, a particular flavor of uh, the Ethernet protocol. And if you don't speak it, you're not getting connected to the network. And that's why all of the laptops you buy can connect to the network because they speak the same implementation of that particular standard. That's exactly what we want to achieve here by, by opening it up. And, and uh, yes, of course, there is, there, is, there is people, you know, traditional uh, for the last decades, it hasn't been the case like that. And and it's not a threat to your business. It is an opportunity to your business because you're going to achieve so much more uh, opportunity to, to interconnect and to integrate and to, uh, to have other people use your capabilities as such. That's what we believe in. That's what we promote. That's what the digital ceiling ecosystem is all about. Um, so, and that's hopefully also why Eager is part of that. Dwight? Yeah, that, I think the same way, John. That's... Uh, you see how even in some of the companies that the product development uh, is so closed off and so difficult to integrate with that people in the field uh, that are installing, that are you know, wearing the same company badge, can't innovate uh, with ideas that they've got right in their hands. You know, they're, they're some of the best people to understand the domain problem. They're in the trenches, but... You know, they'll wait years and, and sometimes never realize as to what they think would, could be a good idea. So by, you know, that's, that, that's kind, of a, uh, kind of just right in your face, but um, even across an ecosystem between companies, uh, you know, uh, uh, individual uh, products and, and uh, services are so much more valuable 
when they can be leveraged in a multitude of ways and perspectives. And you're not going to get that innovation unless there is an open platform. Right. Okay. Now, at the moment, we we have a world where um, we have got different drivers doing different jobs. We've got um, drivers that are operating on on a sort of a mains dimming platform. We've got Dali dimming. We've got digital dimming. The benefit that they all have is that they're all just linked together by bits of copper. Um, here, the suspicion is that what we're actually talking about is lots and lots of microcomputers all talking to one another. I have enough trouble getting my laptop to talk to my desktop most of the time. Um, the, the question about new build and existing building keeps coming up because it seems to be that the idea that you know, if you're starting from scratch, that you can do things that you can't do with something that's already there. This is the, again, this this is my you know the building is 10 years old and you want to build an extension onto it. Um, are we asking lighting manufacturers? to buy into this in a wholesale way that basically says there is now, a, they, they, they will have to produce a catalog of power over ethernet luminaires um, where everything is, you know, is either um, an, an Igor fitting uh, or it's somebody else's fitting and it has to connect one to the other um, or will luminaire manufacturers stay aloof from that, which is when I talk to these guys, I think an awful lot of them are saying, we're not going to make a commitment on this one yet because we don't know which, which way it's going to play. But will they be forced to it? Will they be forced to have to say, this is where we're going, these are the people that we're going to go with, and this is the range that people will buy? And, and what conversations so, are you having, Dwight, about this? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give you my spin again. And, and, and so the entire goal of, of making it network connected is that you need one wire to connect and to power. The traditional way of connecting luminaires is you need the two wires. You need a power cable and you need a control cable. That <laughs> cabling alone, the, the return on investment on cabling alone is typically warranting the change from traditional technologies to PoE-based uh, technology. So that, that, that's one stage. Now, is everybody going to change and everybody going to go for? Um, well, we believe that there is, there is certainly a big opportunity. Dwight has shown the slide on the opportunity in this space. Um, will this happen overnight? I think it will take a little bit of time. This, this is a traditional conservative um, industry that we believe because of the opportunities and because of the integration of all the data and the censoring traffic into it, we believe that the opportunity, uh, you know, supersedes, uh, you know, the cost of doing this. And, and, there is, and there is, you know, people out there who are willing to help if you're a traditional player and you want to go into the LED, uh, the POE um, uh, market, there is people who can help you. So you don't have to be, um, you know, uh, reinventing the wheel, so to speak, which already others did. So, um, Dwight, what, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, you know, you look at technology adoption and, and how that is really a bell curve. And you have those early adopters, you have laggards, uh, conservatives. You, you've, so, you know, things are going to take a time to ramp up. This is an opportunity for people who want to differentiate themselves from a, a typical commodity product like lighting and, and create something that trans into a value add that they can even, you know, uh, create their own uh, services that link into the platform uh, and, and drive something unique there. Or there's lots of ways to drive uniqueness, and that that differentiator is going to separate you from your competitors in a highly competitive marketplace that's uh, very price driven and not value driven. So it, it's a huge opportunity. And for the people who take the early steps, they're going to be well positioned in the marketplace, their brand's going to be recognized as being a thought leader and as a disruptor. And uh, that's going to build brand equity for them in ways that uh, they will realize over years and, and those that don't participate uh, will probably wish they had. So uh, that's my thought on it. 
Do we see another industry coming at us here as well in terms of the people who will be developing the apps? Uh, I mean, I, I'm assuming that, that, that whilst the, the network, the hardware, the cabling all brings its own sort of its own challenges. But what John said something right at the start, and that is at the end of the day, it's all about how we use this stuff. Um, and because this is all being run as a, as, as a computer-based system, it suggests that it will be app-based. People will be writing um, programs to do things that I can't even begin, begin to imagine what those, those things might be. But does that mean that we are, we are also looking for another group of people onto whom we basically who will then bolt onto the hardware side of things to make it a more attractive option for the facilities managers and for the architects and for the clients to go now i can see where you're going because i can see how this system is going to work for me at the end of the day and and how and, and if that is the case how well are we doing in 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 the app development world yeah so very very good question the number one question I get when I talk to customers, and by the way, my customers here are not the IT folks. They are in the room because they want to make sure that whatever you do is safe and secure. The number one question is being answered, being questioned by is uh, the facility managers and the facility folks who actually have the budget to make this happen. The number one question they, they ask me all the time is, how is my building being used? Today, you don't know. Today, you have no clue which rooms are being used, which rooms are not used. Uh, you have no clue if a room was used throughout the day, so that it has to be cleaned or not. Uh, so just imagine that in every room, you have sensors uh, being able to understand what has happened in that room at what point of the day. Imagine that you know that. Imagine that you can optimize your building according to real-time information. So that is the, what I, I don't like to call very much a killer app, but I think for facility folks, this is the killer app for them because now they can do their work so much better, so much more informed, um, and that's actually why we do it for. So you're absolutely right. The technology and all the stuff aside, it's about what you can do with it. And yes, people will now take the data and will optimize it for you so that you can achieve better ways for occupation of your building, and there will be lots of things we haven't even thought about what you can do with that data. That's why it needs to be open. That's why it needs to be standard-based. That's why it needs to be open for people to build that application on top of it, just as simple as you can create applications in an app store from whatever platform. Okay. Right, well, we've, yeah. we've, we've gone beyond the top of the hour. Thanks very much, guys. Um, I'm going to ask one last question. Are there any... Uh, so exemplar projects out there in the world that we could point at and, and, and say to say to our clients, you really ought to go and have a look and see what they're doing there because that is the future. Is, is, uh, have we reached that stage? Or is, is it live or, or are we still um, in the um, in the land of promise but no delivery yet? Where are we? Yeah, it's uh, at that emerging stage right now. So there are a few projects, and I can uh, follow up with, with some uh, examples of those. Um, it, it's still in the early stage, but you can still see uh, you know, these different capabilities that we're talking about in effect and, and uh, being exercised. Okay. Thank you for it. Thanks for that. And the more information you, you, you can get to us, the, 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 the more we can put on Lux Review. And, and let people know just what the, what the state of play is. Um, I'd like to thank Dwight Stewart, um, founder and CTO of Igor, and I'd like to thank John uh, Barkermans, Chief, T uh, the Chief Technical Officer of Cisco's Internet of Things Solutions Group. There's a man with a very big business card. Um, for a fantastic hour, lots and lots of information, and, I mean, this is a future um, which we will keep talking about, I'm absolutely sure. Um, everyone, thanks for your attention. Uh, it's been great, and I look forward to having you back in a couple of weeks' time when we can uh, look at how the best way to test our emergency lighting systems. Thanks very much, everyone, and goodbye. Right, thank you.